Section 28 of Figures of Several Centuries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Figures of Several Centuries by Arthur Simmons. Section 28. Walter Pater. Writing about Botticelli in that essay which first interpreted Botticelli to the modern world, Pater said, after naming the supreme artists Michelangelo or Leonardo, but besides these great men, there is a certain number of artists who have a distinct faculty of their own by which they convey to us a peculiar quality of pleasure which we cannot get elsewhere. And these, too, have their place in general culture and must be interpreted to it by those who have felt their charm strongly and are often the objects of a special diligence and a consideration wholly affectionate just because there is not about them the stress of a great name and authority. It is among these rare artists, so much more interesting to many than the very greatest that Pater belongs, and he can only be properly understood, loved, or even measured by those to whom it is the delicacies of fine literature that chiefly appeal. There have been greater prose writers in our language, even in our time, but he was, as Mallarmé called him, le prosateur ouvrage par excellence de ce temps. For strangeness and subtlety of temperament, for rarity and delicacy of form, for something incredibly attractive to those who felt his attraction, he was as unique in our age as Botticelli in the great age of Raphael, and he too, above all to those who knew him, can scarcely fail to become not only the object of a special diligence, but also of a consideration wholly affectionate, not lessened by the slowly increasing stress of authority, which is coming to be laid almost by the world in general on his name. In the work of Pater, thought moves to music and does all its hard work as if in play and Pater seems to listen for his thought, and to overhear it, as the poet overhears his song in the air. It is like music, and has something of the character of poetry, yet, above all, it is precise, individual, thought filtered through a temperament, and it comes to us as it does because the style which clothes and fits it is a style in which, to use some of his own words, the writer succeeds in saying what he wills. The style of Pater has been praised and blamed for its particular qualities of color, harmony, weaving, but it has not always or often been realized that what is most wonderful in the style is precisely its adaptability to every shade of meaning or intention, its extraordinary closeness in following the turns of thought, the waves of sensation in the man himself. Everything in Pater was in harmony, when you got accustomed to its particular forms of expression, the heavy frame, so slow and deliberate in movement, so settled in repose, the timid and yet scrutinizing eyes, the mannered yet so personal voice, the precise pausing speech, with its urbanity, its almost painful conscientiousness of utterance, the whole outer mask, in short, worn for protection and out of courtesy, yet molded upon the inner truth of nature like a mask molded upon the features which it covers. And the books are the man, literally the man in many accents, turns of phrase, and far more than the man himself, whom one felt through his few friendly, intimate, serious words, the inner life of his soul coming close to us in a slow and gradual revelation. He has said, in the first essay of his which we have. The artist and he who has treated life in the spirit of art desires only to be shown to the world as he really is. As he comes nearer and nearer to perfection, the veil of an outer life, not simply expressive of the inward, becomes thinner and thinner. And Pater seemed to draw up into himself every form of earthly beauty, or of the beauty made by men and many forms of knowledge and wisdom and a sense of human things, which was neither that of the lover nor of the priest, but partly of both, and his work was the giving out of all this again, 
with a certain labor to give it wholly. It is all, the criticism and the stories and the writing about pictures and places, a confession. The vrai vérité, as he was fond of saying, about the world in which he lived. That world, he thought, was open to all. He was sure that it was the real blue and green earth, and that he caught the tangible moments as they passed. It was a world into which we can only look, not enter, for none of us have his secret. But part of his secret was in the gift and cultivation of a passionate temperance, an unrelaxing attentiveness to whatever was rarest and most delightful in passing things. In Pater, logic is of the nature of ecstasy, and ecstasy never soars wholly beyond the reach of logic. Pater is keen in pointing out the liberal and spendthrift weakness of Coleridge in his thirst for the absolute, his hunger for eternity, and for his part he is content to set all his happiness and all his mental energies on a relative basis, on a valuation of the things of eternity under the form of time. He asks for no larger flowers than the best growth of the earth, but he would choose them flower by flower and for himself. He finds life worth just living, a thing satisfying in itself. If you are careful to extract its essence, moment by moment, not in any calculated hedonism, even of the mind, but in a quiet, discriminating acceptance of whatever is beautiful, active, or illuminating in every moment. As he grew older, he added something more like a stoic sense of duty to the old, properly, and severely Epicurean doctrine of pleasure. Pleasure was never, for Pater, less than the essence of all knowledge, all experience, and not merely all that is rarest in sensation. It was religious from the first, and had always to be served with a strict ritual. Only be sure it is passion, he said, of that spirit of divine motion to which he appealed for the quickening of our sense of life, our sense of ourselves. Be sure, he said, that it does yield you this fruit of a quickened, multiplied consciousness. What he cared most for at all times was that which could give the highest quality to our moments as they pass. He differed only, to a certain extent, in his estimation of what that was. The herb, the wine, the gem of the preface to the Renaissance tended more and more to become, under less outward symbols of perfection, the discovery, the new faculty, the privileged apprehension by which the imaginative regeneration of the world should be brought about, or even at times a brooding over what the soul passes and must pass through, or a bois with nothingness, or with those offended mysterious powers that may really occupy it. End of section 28. Recorded by Sheila Blunt. Section 29 of Figures of Several Centuries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Section 29 of Figures of Several Centuries by Arthur Simmons. When I first met Pater, he was nearly 50. I did not meet him for about two years after he had been writing to me, and his first letter reached me when I was just over 21. I had been writing verse all my life, and what Browning was to me in verse, Pater, from about the age of 17, had been to me in prose. Meredith May the third, But his form of art was not, I knew, never could be, mine. Verse, I suppose, requires no teaching, but it was from reading Pater's Studies in the History of the Renaissance in its first edition on ribbed paper, I have the feel of it still in my fingers, that I realized that prose also could be a fine art. That book opened a new world to me, or rather gave me the key or secret of the world in which I was living. It taught me that there was a beauty besides the beauty of what one calls inspiration and comes and goes and cannot be taught or followed. That life, which had seemed to me of so little moment, 
could be itself a work of art. From that book I realized, for the first time, that there was anything interesting or vital in the world besides poetry and music. I caught from it an unlimited curiosity, or at least the direction of curiosity, into definite channels. The knowledge that there was such a person as Pater in the world, an occasional letter from him, an occasional meeting, and gradually the definite encouragement of my work in which for some years he was unfailingly generous and attentive, meant more to me at that time than I can well indicate or even realize now. It was through him that my first volume of verse was published, and it was through his influence and counsels that I trained myself to be infinitely careful in all matters of literature. Influence and counsel were always in the direction of sanity, restraint, precision. I remember a beautiful phrase which he once made up, in his delaying way, with wells and no doubts in it, to describe, and to describe supremely, a person whom I had seemed to him to be disparaging. He does, he said meditatively, remind me of, well, of a steam engine stuck in the mud. But he is so enthusiastic. Pater liked people to be enthusiastic, but with him, enthusiasm was an ardent quietude, guarded by the wary humor that protects the sensitive. He looked upon undue earnestness, even in outward manner, in a world through which the artist is bound to go on a wholly secret errand as bad form, which shocked him as much in persons as bad style did in books. He hated every form of extravagance, noise, mental or physical, with a temperamental hatred. He suffered from it in his nerves and in his mind, and he had no less dislike of whatever seemed to him either morbid or sordid, two words which he often used to express his distaste for things and people. He never would have appreciated writers like Verlaine because of what seemed to him perhaps unnecessarily sordid in their lives. It pained him, as it pains some people, perhaps only because they are more acutely sensitive than others, to walk through mean streets where people are poor, miserable, and hopeless. And since I have mentioned Verlaine, I may say that what Pater most liked in poetry was the very opposite of such work as that of Verlaine, which he might have been supposed likely to like. I do not think it was actually one of Verlaine's poems, but something done after his manner in English that some reviewer once quoted, saying, That to our mind would be Mr. Pater's ideal of poetry. Pater said to me, with a sad wonder, I simply don't know what he meant. What he liked in poetry was something even more definite that can be got in prose, and he valued poets like Dante and like Rossetti for their delight in concrete definition, not even quite seeing the ultimate magic of such things as Kubla Khan, which he omitted in a brief selection from the poetry of Coleridge. In the most interesting letter which I ever had from him, the only letter which went to six pages, he says, 12 Earl's Terrace, Kensington West, January 8, 1888. My dear Mr. Simmons, I feel much flattered at your choosing me as an arbiter in the matter of your literary work, and thank you for the pleasure I have had in reading carefully the two poems you have sent me. I don't use the word arbiter loosely for critic, but suppose a real controversy on the question whether you shall spend your best energies in writing verse between your poetic aspirations on the one side and prudence, calculating results, on the other. Well, judging by these two pieces, I should say that you have a poetic talent remarkable, especially at the present day, for precise and intellectual grasp on the matter it deals with. Rossetti, I believe, said that the value of every artistic product was in direct proportion to the amount of purely intellectual force that went to the initial conception of it, and it is just this intellectual conception which seems to me to be so conspicuously wanting in what in some ways is the most characteristic verse of our time, especially that of our secondary poets. 
in your own pieces, particularly in your MS, a revenge, I find Rossetti's requirement fulfilled, and should anticipate great things from one who has the talent of conceiving his motive with so much firmness and tangibility, with that close logic, if I may say so, which is an element in any genuinely imaginative process. It is clear to me that you aim at this, and it is what gives your verses, to my mind, great interest. Otherwise, I think the two pieces of unequal excellence greatly preferring, a revenge to Bell and Camp, reserving some doubt whether the watch, as the lover's gift, is not a little bourgeois, I think this piece worthy of any poet. It has that aim of concentration and organic unity which I value greatly both in prose and verse. Bell in Camp pleases me less, for the same reason which makes me put Rossetti's Jenny and some of Browning's pathetic satiric pieces below the rank which many assign them. In no one of the poems I am thinking of is the inherent sordidness of everything in the person supposed except the one poetic trait then under treatment quite forgotten. Otherwise, I feel the pathos, the humor of the piece, in the full sense of the word humor, and the skill with which you have worked out your motive therein. I think the present age an unfavorable one to poets, at least in England. The young poet comes into a generation which has produced a large amount of first-rate poetry and an enormous amount of good secondary poetry. You know I give a high place to the literature of prose as a fine art, and therefore hope you won't think me brutal in saying that the admirable qualities of your verse are those also of imaginative prose, as I think is the case also with much of Browning's finest verse. I should say, make prose your principal metier as a man of letters and publish your verse as a more intimate gift for those who already value you for your pedestrian work in literature. I should think you ought to find no difficulty in finding a publisher for poems such as those you have sent to me. I am more than ever anxious to meet you. Letters are such poor means of communication. Don't come to London without making an appointment to come and see me here. Very sincerely yours, Walter Pater. Browning, one of my best-loved writers, is a phrase I find in his first letter to me in December 1886, thanking me for a little book on Browning which I had just published. There is, I think, no mention of any other writer except Shakespeare, besides the reference to Rossetti, which I have just quoted, in any of the fifty or sixty letters which I have from him. Everything that is said about books is a direct matter of business, work which he is doing, of which he tells me, of which I was doing, about which he advises and encourages me. In practical things, Pater was wholly vague, troubled by their persistence when they pressed upon him. To wrap up a book to send by post was an almost intolerable effort, and he had another reason for hesitating. I take your copy of Shakespeare's sonnets with me, he writes in June 1889, hoping to be able to restore it to you there, lest it should get bruised by transit through the post. He wrote letters with distaste, never really well, and almost always with excuses or regrets in them, am so overburdened, my time, I mean, just now with pupils' lectures and the making thereof, or with hopes for a meeting, letters are such poor means of communication. When are we to meet? Or, as a sort of hasty makeshift, I sent this prompt answer, for I know by experience that when I delay, my delays are apt to be lengthy. A review took him sometimes a year to get through and remained in the end, like his letters, a little cramped, never finished to the point of ease like his published writings. To lecture was a great trial to him. Two of the three lectures which I have heard in my life were given by Pater, one on Merimé at the London Institution in November 1890, and the other on Raphael at Tonby Hall in 1892. I never saw a man suffer a severe humiliation, the act of reading his written lecture was an agony, 
which communicated itself to the main part of the audience. Before going into the hall at Whitechapel, he had gone into a church to compose his mind a little. Between the discomfort of the underground railway and the distress of the lecture hall, in a room, if he was not among very intimate friends, Pater was really quite at his ease. But he liked being among people, and he made the greater satisfaction overcome the lesser reluctance. He was particularly fond of cats, and I remember one evening when I had been dining with him in London, the quaint, solemn, and perfectly natural way in which he took up the great black Persian, kissed it, and set it down carefully again on his way upstairs. Once at Oxford, he told me that Monsieur Bourget had sent him the first volume of his Essai de Psychologie Contemporaine, and that the cat got hold of the book and torn up the part containing the essay on Baudelaire and as Baudelaire was such a lover of cats, I thought she might have spared him. We were talking once about fairs, and I had been saying how fond I was of them. He said, I'm fond of them too. I always go to fairs. I'm getting to find they are very similar. Then he began to tell me about the fairs in France, and I remember, as if it were an unpublished fragment in one of his stories, the minute colored impression of the booths, the little white horses of the roundabouts, and the little wild beast shows in which it had most struck him was the interest of the French peasant in the wolf, a creature he might have seen in his own woods. An English clown would not have looked at a wolf if he could have seen a tiger. I once asked Pater if his family was really connected with that of the painter Jean-Baptiste Pater. He said, I think so, I believe so, I always say so. The relationship has never been verified, but one would like to believe it, to find something linally Dutch in the English writer. It was no doubt through this kind of family interest that he came to work upon Goncourt's essay and the contemporary life of Watteau by the Count de Quelus, printed in the first series of L'Art du XVIIIe siècle, out of which he has made certainly the most living with of his imaginary portraits, that Prince of Court Painters, which is supposed to be the journal of a sister of Jean-Baptiste Pater, whom we see in one of Watteau's portraits in the Louvre. As far back as 1889, note 4, Pater was working towards a second volume of imaginary portraits, of which Hippolytus Bailed was to have been one, he had another subject in Moroni's portrait of a tailor in the National Gallery, whom he was going to make a burgomaster, and another was to have been a study of life in the time of Albigensian persecution. There was also to be a modern study. Could this have been Emerald Uthwart? No doubt, Apollo in Picardy, published in 1893, would have gone into the volume. The Child in the House, which was printed as an imaginary portrait in Macmillan's magazine in 1878, was really meant to be the first chapter of a romance, which was to show the poetry of modern life, something he said, as Aurora Lee does. There is much personal detail in it, the Red Hawthorn, for instance, and he used to talk to me of the old house at Tunbridge, where his great aunt lived and where he spent much of his time when a child. He remembered the gypsies there, and their caravans, when they came down for the hop-picking, and the old lady in her large cap going out on the lawn to do battle with the surveyors who had come to mark out a railway across it, and his terror of the train, and of the red flag, which meant blood. It was because he always dreamed of going on with it that he did not reprint this imaginary portrait in the book of imaginary portraits. But he did not go on with it because having begun the large labor of Marius, it was out of his mind for many years, and when in 1889 he still spoke of finishing it, he was conscious that he could never continue it in the same style, and that it would not be satisfactory to rewrite it in his severer later manner. It remains, perhaps fortunately, 
a fragment to which no continuation could ever add a more essential completeness. Style in Pater varied more than is generally supposed in the course of his development, and though never thought of as a thing apart from what it expresses, was with him a constant preoccupation. Let writers, he said, make time to write English more as a learned language. It has been said that Ruskin, De Quincey, and Flaubert were among the chief origins of Pater's style. It is curiously significant that matter in Pater was developed before style, and that in the bare and angular outlines of his earliest fragment, Diaphanete, there is already the substance which is to be clothed upon by beautiful and appropriate flesh in the studies of the Renaissance. Ruskin, I never heard him mention, but I do not doubt that there to the young man beginning to concern himself with beauty in art and literature was at least a quickening influence. Of De Quincey, he spoke with an admiration which I had difficulty in sharing, and I remember his showing me with pride a set of his works bound in half parchment, with pale gold lettering on the white backs, and with the cinnamon edges which he was so fond of. Of Flaubert, we rarely met without speaking. He thought Julien L'Hospitalier as perfect as anything he had done. L'Education Sentimentale was one of the books which he advised me to read, that and La Rouge et la Noir of Stendhal, and he spoke with particular admiration of two episodes in the former, The Sickness and the Death of the Child. Of the Goncourts he spoke with admiration tempered by dislike. Their books often repelled him, yet their way of doing things seemed to him just the way things should be done, and done before almost anyone else. He often read Madame Gervaise, and he spoke of Chéri, for all its immodesty, as an admirable thing, and a model for all such studies. Once, as we were walking in Oxford, he pointed to a window and said with a slow smile, This is where I get my Zolas. He was always a little on his guard in respect of books, and just as he read Flaubert and Goncourt because they were intellectual neighbors, so he could read Zola for mere pastime, knowing that there would be nothing there to distract him. I remember telling him about the story of an African farm and of the wonderful human quality in it. He said, repeating his favorite formula, No doubt you are quite right, but I do not suppose I shall ever read it. And he explained to me that he was always writing something, and that while he was writing he did not allow himself to read anything which might possibly affect him too strongly by bringing a new current of emotion to bear upon him. He was quite content that his mind should keep, as a solitary prisoner, its own dream of a world. It was that prisoner's dream of a world that it was his whole business as a writer to remember, to perpetuate. 1906. Footnote 4. In this same year, he intended to follow the appreciations by a volume of Studies of Greek Remains, in which he then meant to include the studies in Platonism, not yet written. And he had thought of putting together a volume of theory, which was to include the essay on style. In two or three years' time, he thought Gaston de Latour would be finished. End of section 29. Recorded by Sheila Blunt. Section 30 of Figures of Several Centuries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Figures of Several Centuries by Arthur Simons. Section 30. The Goncourt. My first visit to Edmond de Goncourt was in May 1892. I remember my immense curiosity about that house beautiful at Auteuil, of which I had heard so much, and my excitement as I rang the bell and was shown at once into the garden where Goncourt was just saying good-bye to some friends. He was carelessly dressed, without a collar, and with the usual loosely knotted large white scarf rolled round his neck. 
he was wearing a straw hat and it was only afterwards that i could see the fine sweep of the white hair falling across the forehead i thought him the most distinguished-looking man of letters i had ever seen for he had at once the distinction of race of fine breeding and of that delicate artistic genius which with him was so intimately a part of things beautiful and distinguished he had the eyes of an old eagle a general air of dignified collectedness a rare and a rarely charming smile which came out like a ray of sunshine in the instinctive pleasure of having said a witty or graceful thing to which one's response had been immediate when he took me indoors into that house which was a museum i noticed the delicacy of his hands and the tenderness with which he handled his treasures touching them as if he loved them with little unconscious murmurs quel goût quel goût these rose-coloured rooms with their embroidered ceilings were filled with cabinets of beautiful things japanese carvings and prints the miraculous plongeurs always in perfect condition je cherche le beau albums had been made for him in japan and in these he inserted prints mounting others upon silver and gold paper which formed a sort of frame he showed me his eighteenth-century designs among which i remember his pointing out one a chardin i think as the first he had ever bought he had been sixteen at the time and he bought it for twelve francs when we came to the study the room in which he worked he showed me all his own first editions carefully bound and first editions of flaubert baudelaire gautier with those less interesting to me of the men of later generations he spoke of himself and his brother with a serene pride which seemed to me perfectly dignified and appropriate and i remember his speaking with a parenthetic disdain of the brouillard scandinave in which it seemed to him that france was trying to envelop herself at the best it would be but un mauvais brouillard of the endeavour which he and his brother had made to represent the only thing worth representing la vie vécue la vraie verite as in painting he said all depends on the way of seeing l'optique out of twenty-four men who will describe what they have all seen it is only the twenty-fourth who will find the right way of expressing it there is a true thing i have said in my journal he went on the thing is to find a lorgnette and he put up his hands to his eyes adjusting them carefully through which to see things my brother and i invented a lorgnette and the young men have taken it from us how true that is and how significantly it states just what is most essential in the work of the goncourt it is a new way of seeing literally a new way of seeing which they have invented and it is in the invention of this that they have invented that new language of which purists have so long so vainly and so thanklessly complained you remember that saying of masson the mask of gautier in char de i am a man for whom the visible world exists well that is true also of the goncourt but in a different way the delicacies of fine literature that phrase of pater always comes into my mind when i think of the goncourt and indeed pater seems to me the only english writer who has ever handled language at all in their manner or spirit i frequently heard pater refer to certain of their books to madame Gervaise, to l'art du dix-huitème siècle to chérie with a passing objection to what he called the immodesty of this last book and a strong emphasis in the assertion that that was how it seemed to him a book should be written i repeated this once to goncourt trying to give him some idea of what pater's work was like and he lamented that his ignorance of english prevented him from what he instinctively realized would be so intimate an enjoyment pater was of course far more scrupulous more limited in his choice of epithet less feverish in his variations of cadence and naturally so for he dealt with another subject matter and was careful of another kind of truth but with both there was that passionately intent preoccupation with the delicacies of fine literature both achieved a style of the most personal sincerity tout grand écrivain de tous les temps 
said goncourt ne se reconnaît absolument qu'à cela c'est qu'il a une langue personnelle une langue dont chaque page chaque ligne est signée pour la lecture lettrée comme si son nom était au bas de cette page de cette ligne and this style in both was accused by the literary criticism of its generation of being insincere artificial and therefore reprehensible it is difficult in speaking of edmond de goncourt to avoid attributing to him the whole credit of the work which has so long borne his name alone that is an error which he himself would never have pardoned mon frere et moi was the phrase constantly on his lips and in his journal his prefaces he has done full justice to the vivid and admirable qualities of that talent which all the same would seem to have been the lesser the more subservient of the two jules i think had a more active sense of life a more generally human curiosity for the novels of edmond written since his brother's death have in even that excessively specialized world of their common observation a yet more specialized choice and direction but edmond there is no doubt was in the strictest sense the writer and it is above all for the qualities of its writing that the work of the goncourt will live it has been largely concerned with truth truth to the minute details of human character sensation and circumstance and also of the document the exact words of the past but this devotion to fact to the curiosities of fact has been united with an even more persistent devotion to the curiosities of expression they have invented a new language that was the old reproach against them let it be their distinction like all writers of an elaborate carefulness they have been accused of sacrificing both truth and beauty to a deliberate eccentricity deliberate their style certainly was eccentric it may perhaps sometimes have been but deliberately eccentric no it was their belief that a writer should have a personal style a style as peculiar to himself as his handwriting and indeed i seem to see in the handwriting of edmond de goncourt just the characteristics of his style every letter is formed carefully separately with a certain elegant stiffness it is beautiful formal too regular in the continual slight novelty of its form to be quite clear at a glance very personal very distinguished writing it may be asserted that the goncourt are not merely men of genius but are perhaps the typical men of letters of the close of our century they have all the curiosities and the acquirements the new weaknesses and the new powers that belong to our age and they sum up in themselves certain theories aspirations ways of looking at things notions of literary duty and artistic conscience which have only lately become at all actual and some of which owe to them their very origin to be not merely novelists inventing a new kind of novel but historians not merely historians but the historians of a particular century and of what was intimate and what is unknown in it to be also discriminating indeed innovating critics of art but of a certain section of art the eighteenth century in france and in japan to collect pictures and be below beautiful things always of the french and japanese eighteenth century these excursions in so many directions with their audacities and their careful limitations their bold novelty and their scrupulous exactitude in detail are characteristic of what is the finest in the modern conception of culture and the modern ideal in art look for instance at the goncourt's view of history quand les civilisations commençons quand les peuples se formant l'histoire et drame ou geste les siècles qui ont précédé notre siècle ne demanda ayant à l'historien qui le personnage de l'homme et le portrait de son génie le dix-huitième siècle demande l'homme qui était cet homme d'état cet homme de guerre ce poète ce peintre ce grand homme de science ou de métier l'homme qui était en cet acteur 
le cœur qui a vécu derrière cet esprit il les exige et les réclame et s'il ne peut recueillir tout cet être moral toute la vie intérieure il commande du moins qu'on lui en apporte une trace un jour un lambeau une relique from this theory this conviction came that marvelous series of studies in the eighteenth century in france la femme au dix huitième siècle portrait intime du dix huitième siècle la du barry and the others made entirely out of documents autographed letters scraps of costume engravings songs the unconscious self-revelations of the time forming as they justly say l'histoire intime c'est ce roman vrai que la postérité appellera peut-être un jour l'histoire humaine to be the bookworm and the magician to give the actual documents but not to set barren fact by barren fact to find a soul and a voice in documents to make them more living and more charming than the charm of life itself that is what the goncourt have done and it is through this conception of history that they have found their way to that new conception of the novel which has revolutionized the entire art of fiction aujourd'hui they wrote in eighteen sixty four in the preface to germany le Setue, que le roman s'élargit et grandit qu'il commence à être la grande forme sérieuse passionnée vivante de l'étude littéraire et de l'enquête sociale qu'il devient par l'analyse et par la recherche psychologique l'histoire morale contemporaine aujourd'hui que le roman s'est imposé les études et les devoirs de la science il peut revendiquer les libertés et les franchises le république aime le roman faux is another brave declaration in the same preface ce roman est un roman vrai but what precisely is it that the goncourt understood by un roman vrai the old notion of the novel was that it should be an entertaining record of incidents or adventures told for their own sake a plain straightforward narrative of facts the aim being to produce as nearly as possible an effect of continuity of nothing having been omitted the statement so to speak of a witness on oath in a word it is the same as the old notion of history drama ou geste that is not how the goncourt apprehend life or how they conceive it should be rendered as in the study of history they seek mainly the anad caring only to record that so it is the anad of life that they conceive to be the main concern the real inner history and for them the anad of life consists in the noting of the sensations it is of the sensations that they have resolved to be the historians not of action nor of emotion properly speaking nor of moral conceptions but of an inner life which is all made up of the perceptions of the senses it is scarcely too paradoxical to say that they are psychologists for whom the soul does not exist one thing they know exists the sensation flashed through the brain the image on the mental retina having found that they bodily omit all the rest as of no importance trusting to their instinct or selection of retaining all that really matters it is the painter's method a selection made almost visually the method of the painter who accumulates detail on detail in his patient many-sided observation of his subject and then omits everything which is not an essential part of the ensemble which he sees thus the new conception of what the real truth of things consists in has brought with it inevitably an entirely new form a breaking up of the plain straightforward narrative into chapters which are generally quite disconnected and sometimes of less than a page in length a very apt image for this new curious manner of narrative has been found somewhat maliciously by monsieur le maître un homme qui marche à l'intérieur d'une maison si nous regardons du dehors apparaît successivement à chaque fenêtre et dans les intervalles nous échappe ces fenêtres ce sont les chapitres de monsieur 
de Goncourt. Encore, he says, y a-t-il plusieurs de ces fenêtres où l'homme que nous attendions ne passe point? That certainly is the danger of the method. No doubt the Goncourt, in their passion for the Anédie, leave out certain things because they are obvious, even if they are obviously true and obviously important. That is the defect of their quality. To represent life by a series of moments and to choose these moments for a certain subtlety and rarity in them is to challenge grave perils. Nor are these the only perils which the Goncourt have constantly before them. There are others essential to their natures, to their preferences. And first of all, as we may see on every page of that miraculous journal, which will remain doubtless the truest, deepest, most poignant piece of human history that they have ever written, they are sick men, seeing life through the medium of diseased nerves. Notre oeuvre Entier, writes Edmond de Goncourt, repose sur la maladie nerveuse, les peintures de la maladie. Nous les avons tirées de nous-mêmes, et à force de nous disaquer, nous sommes arrivés à une sensitivité supra aiguë que blessions les infiniment petits de la vie. This unhealthy sensitiveness explains much, the singular merits as well as certain shortcomings or deviations in their work. The Goncourt vision of reality might almost be called an exaggerated sense of the truth of things, such a sense as diseased nerves inflict upon one, sharpening the acuteness of every sensation, or somewhat such a sense as one derives from hashish, which simply intensifies, yet in a veiled and fragrant way, the charm or the disagreeableness of outward things, the notion of time, the notion of space. What the Goncourt paint is the subtler poetry of reality, its unusual aspects, and they evoke it fleetingly, like Whistler. They do not render it in hard outline, like Flaubert, like Manet. As in the world of Whistler, so in the world of the Goncourt, we see cities in which there are always fireworks at Cremorne and fair women reflected beautifully and curiously in mirrors. It is a world which is extraordinarily real, but there is choice, there is curiosity in the aspect of reality which it presents. Compare the descriptions which form so large a part of the work of the Goncourt with those of Théophile Gautier, who may reasonably be said to have introduced the practice of eloquent writing about places, and also the exact description of them. Gautier describes miraculously, but it is, after all, the ordinary observation carried to perfection, or rather the ordinary pictorial observation. The Goncourt only tell you the things that Gautier leaves out, they find new fantastic points of view discover secrets in things curiosities of beauty often acute distressing in the aspects of quite ordinary places they see things as an artist an ultra subtle artist of the impressionist kind might see them seeing them indeed always very consciously with a deliberate attempt upon them in just that partial selecting creative way in which an artist looks at things for the purpose of painting a picture in order to arrive at their effects they shrink from no sacrifice from no excess slang neologism forced construction archaism barbarous epithet nothing comes amiss to them so long as it tends to render a sensation their unique care is that the phrase should live, should palpitate, should be alert, exactly expressive, super subtle in expression, and they prefer indeed a certain perversity in their relations with language, which they would have not merely a passionate and sensuous thing, but complex, with all the curiosities of a delicately depraved instinct. It is the accusation of the severer sort of French critics that the Goncourt have invented a new language, that the language which they use is no longer the calm and faultless French of the past. It is true. It is their distinction. It is the most wonderful of all their inventions. In order to render new sensations, a new vision of things, they have invented a new language.
1894, 1896. End of section 30. Section 31 of Figures of Several Centuries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Figures of Several Centuries by Arthur Simons. Coventry Patmore, Part 1. There are two portraits of Coventry Patmore by Mr. Sargent. One, in the National Portrait Gallery, gives us the man as he ordinarily was. The straggling hair, the drooping eyelid, the large, loose-lipped mouth, the long, thin, furrowed throat, the whole air of gentlemanly ferocity but the other a sketch of the head in profile gives us more than that gives us in the lean strong aquiline head startlingly all that was abrupt fiery and essential in the genius of a rare and misunderstood poet there never was a man less like the popular idea of him than the writer of the angel in the house certainly an autocrat in the home impatient intolerant full of bracing intellectual scorn not always just but always just in intention a disdainful recluse judging all human and divine affairs from a standpoint of imperturbable omniscience coventry patmore charmed one by his whimsical energy his intense sincerity and indeed by the childlike egoism of an absolutely self-centered intelligence speaking of patmore as he was in eighteen seventy nine mr goss says in his admirable memoir three things were in those days particularly noticeable in the head of coventry patmore the vast convex brows arched with vision the bright shrewd bluish-gray eyes the outer fold of one eyelid permanently and humorously drooping and the wilful sensuous mouth these three seemed ever at war among themselves they spoke three different tongues they proclaimed a man of dreams a canny man of business a man of vehement determination it was the harmony of these in apparently discordant contrast which made the face so fascinating the dwellers under this strange mask were three and the problem was how they contrived the common life that is a portrait which is also an interpretation and many of the pages of this angular vivid discordant and yet exquisitely fascinating person are full of a similar insight they contain many of those anecdotes which indicate crises a thing very different from the merely decorative anecdotes of the ordinary biographer the book written by one who has been a good friend to many poets and to none a more valuable friend than to patmore gives us a vivid sense of what patmore was as a man than anything except mr sargent's two portraits and a remarkable article by mr frederick greenwood published after the book as a sort of appendix which it completes on the spiritual side to these portraits of patmore i have nothing of importance to add and i have given my own estimate of patmore as a poet in an essay published in eighteen ninety seven in studies in two literatures but i should like to supplement these various studies by a few supplementary notes and the discussion of a few points chiefly technical connected with his art as a poet i knew patmore only during the last ten years of his life and never with any real intimacy but as i have been turning over a little bundle of his letters written with a quill on grayish-blue paper in the fine careless handwriting which had something of the distinction of the writer it seems to me that there are things in them characteristic enough to be worth preserving the first letter in my bundle is not addressed to me but to the friend through whom i was afterwards to meet him the kindest and most helpful friend whom i or any man ever had james dykes campbell two years before when i was twenty-one i had written 
an introduction to the study of browning campbell had been at my elbow all the time encouraging and checking me he would send back my proof sheets in a network of criticisms and suggestions with my most eloquent passages rigorously shorn my pet eccentricities of phrase severely straightened at the beginning of eighteen eighty eight campbell sent the book to patmore his opinion when it came seemed to me at that time crushing it enraged me i know not on my account but on browning's i read it now with a clearer understanding of what he meant and it is interesting certainly as a more outspoken and detailed opinion on browning than patmore ever printed my dear mr campbell i have read enough of mr arthur simon's clever book on browning to entitle me to judge of it as well as if i had read the whole he does not seem to me to be quite qualified as yet for this kind of criticism he does not seem to have attained to the point of view from which all great critics have judged poetry and art in general he does not see that in art the style in which a thing is said or done is of more importance than the thing said or done indeed he does not appear to know what style means browning has an immense deal of mannerism which in art is always bad he has in his few best passages manner which as far as it goes is good but of style that indescribable reposeful breath of a pure and unique individuality i recognize no trace though i find it distinctly enough in almost every other english poet who has obtained so distinguished a place as browning has done in the estimation of the better class of readers i do not pretend to say absolutely that style does not exist in browning's work but if so its still small voice is utterly overwhelmed for me by the din of the other elements i think i can see in browning's poetry all that mr simons sees though not perhaps all that he fancies he sees but i also discern a want of which he appears to feel nothing and those defects of manner which he acknowledges but thinks little of are to me most distressing and fatal to all enjoyment of the many brilliant qualities they are mixed up with yours very truly coventry patmore campbell i suppose protested in his vigorous fashion against the criticism of browning and the answer to that letter dated may seven is printed on page two hundred sixty four of the second volume of mr basil champney's life of patmore it is a reiteration with further explanations such as that when i said that manner was more important than matter in poetry i really meant that the true matter of poetry could only be expressed by the manner i find the brilliant thinking and the deep feeling in browning but no true individuality though of course his manner is marked enough another letter in the same year to campbell after reading the proofs of my first book of verse days and nights contained a criticism which i thought at the time not less discouraging than the criticism of my browning it seems to me now to contain the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth about that particular book and to allow for whatever i may have done in verse since then the first letter addressed to me is a polite note dated march sixteenth eighteen eighty nine thanking me for a copy of my book and saying i send herewith a little volume of my own which i hope may please you in some of your idle moments the book was a copy of florilegium amantis a selection of his own poems edited by dr garnett up to that time i had read nothing of patmore except fragments of the angel in the house which i had not had the patience to read through i dipped into these pages and as i read for the first time some of the odes of the unknown eros i seem to have made a great discovery here was a whole glittering and peaceful tract of poetry which was like a new world to me i wrote to him full of my enthusiasm and though i heard nothing in then in reply i find among my books a copy of the unknown eros with this inscription arthur simons from coventry patmore july twenty three eighteen ninety the date is the date of his sixty-seventh birthday 
and the book was given to me after a birthday dinner at his house at hastings when i remember a wreath of laurel had been woven in honour of the occasion and he had laughingly but with a quite naive gratification worn it for a while at the end of dinner he was one of the very few poets i have seen who could wear a laurel wreath and not look ridiculous in the summer of that year i undertook to look after the academy for a few weeks a wholly new task to me while mr cotton the editor went for a holiday the death of cardinal newman occurred just then and i wrote to patmore asking him if he would do an obituary notice for me he replied in a letter dated august thirteenth eighteen ninety i should have been very glad to have complied with your request had i felt myself at all able to do the work effectively but my acquaintance with dr newman was very slight and i have no sources of knowledge about his life but such as are open to all i have never taken much interest in contemporary catholic history and politics there are a hundred people who could do what you want better than i could and i can never stir my lazy soul to take up the pen unless i fancy that i have something to say which makes it a matter of conscience that i should say it failing patmore i asked dr greenhill who was then living at hastings and patmore wrote on august sixteen dr greenhill will do your work far better than i could have done it what an intellect we have lost in newman so delicately capable of adjustment that it could crush a hume or crack a kingsley and what an example both in literature and in life but that we have not lost patmore's memory was retentive of good phrases which had once come up under his pen as that witty phrase about crushing and cracking had come up in the course of a brief note scribbled on a half sheet of paper the phrase reappears five years afterwards elaborated into an impressive sentence in the preface to the rod the root and the flower dated lymington may eighteen ninety five the steam hammer of that intellect which could be so delicately adjusted to its task as to be capable of either crushing a hume or cracking a kingsley is no longer at work that tongue which had the weight of a hatchet and the edge of a razor is silent but its mighty task of so representing truth as to make it credible to the modern mind when not interested in unbelief has been done in the same preface will be found a phrase which mr goss quotes from a letter of june seventeenth eighteen eighty eight in which patmore says that the reviewers of his forthcoming book principal in art will say or at least feel ugh ugh the horrid thing it's alive and think it their duty to set their heels on it accordingly by eighteen ninety five the reviewers were replaced by readers zealously christian and the readers instead of setting their heels on it merely put aside this little volume with a cry i find no more letters beyond mere notes and invitations until the end of eighteen ninety three but it was during these years that i saw patmore most often generally when i was staying with dykes campbell at st leonard's when one is five and twenty and writing verse among young men of one's own age also writing verse the occasional companionship of an older poet who stands aside in a dignified seclusion acknowledged respected not greatly loved or in his best work at least widely popular can hardly fail to be an incentive and an invigoration it was with a full sense of my privilege that i walked to and fro with coventry patmore on that high terrace in his garden at hastings or sat in the house watching him smoke cigarette after cigarette or drove with him into the garden or rode with him round the moat of bodium castle with dykes campbell in the stern of the boat always attentive to his words learning from him all i could as he talked of the things i most cared for and of some things for which i cared nothing yes even when he talked of politics i listened with full enjoyment of his bitter humour his ferocious gaiety of onslaught though i was glad when he changed from gladstone to st thomas aquinas and gladder still when he spoke of that other religion poetry i think i never heard him speak long without some reference to st thomas aquinas of whom he has written so often and with so great an enthusiasm it was he who first talked to me of st john of the cross and when eight years later at seville 
i came upon a copy of the first edition of the obras espirituales on a stall of old books in the serpes and began to read and to try to render in english that extraordinary verse which remains with that of saint teresa the finest lyrical verse which spain has produced i understood how much the mystic of the prose and the poet of the unknown eros owed to the noche escura and the llama de amor viva he spoke of the catholic mystics like an explorer who has returned from the perils of far countries with a remembering delight which he can share with few if mr goss is anywhere in his book on just to patmore it is in speaking of the later books of prose the religio poetae and the rod the root and the flower some parts of which seem to him not very important except as extending our knowledge of patmore's mind and as giving us a curious collection of the raw material of his poetry to this i can only reply in some words which i used in writing of the religio poetae and affirm with an emphasis which i only wish to strengthen that here and everywhere and never more than in the exquisite passage which mr goss only quotes to depreciate the prose of patmore is the prose of a poet not prose incompletely executed and aspiring after the nobler order of poetry but adequate and achieved prose of a very rare kind thought in him is of the very substance of poetry and is sustained throughout at almost the lyrical pitch there is in these essays a rarefied air as of the mountain tops of meditation and the spirit of their sometimes remote contemplation is always in one sense as patter has justly said of wordsworth impassioned only in the finest of his poems has he surpassed these pages of chill and ecstatic prose end of coventry patmore part one section thirty two of figures of several centuries this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Figures of Several Centuries by Arthur Simons. But if Patmore spoke, as he wrote, of these difficult things as a traveler speaks of the countries from which he has returned, when he spoke of poetry, it was like one who speaks of his native country. At first, I found it a little difficult to accustom myself to his permanent mental attitude there, with his own implied or stated preeminence tennyson and barnes on the lower slopes browning vaguely in sight the rest of his contemporaries nowhere but after all there was an undisguised simplicity in it which was better because franker than the more customary pride that apes humility or the still baser affectation of indifference a man of genius whose genius like patmore's is of an intense and narrow kind cannot possibly do justice to the work which has every merit but his own nor can he when he is conscious of its equality and technical skill be expected to discriminate between what is more or less valuable in his own work between that is his own greater or less degree of inspiration and here i may quote a letter which patmore wrote to me dated lymington december thirty one eighteen ninety three about a review of mine in which i had greeted him as a poet one of the most essential poets of our time but had ventured to say perhaps petulantly what i felt about a certain part of his work i thank you for the copy of the anathem containing your generous and well-written notice of religio poetae there is much in it that needs be gratifying to me and nothing that i feel disposed to complain of but your allusion to the dinner-table domesticities of the angel in the house i think that you might have been a little misled as almost everybody has been by the differing characters of the meters of the angel and eros the meats and wines of the two are in very great part almost identical in character but in one case they are served on the deal table of the octosyllabic quatrain and in the other they are spread on the fine irregular rock of the free tetrameter in his own work he could see no flaw he knew better than anyone 
how nearly it answered almost everywhere to his own intention and of his own intentions he could be no critic it was from this standpoint of absolute satisfaction with what he had himself done that he viewed other men's work necessarily in the case of one so certain of himself with a measure of dissatisfaction he has said in print fundamentally foolish things about writers living and dead and yet remains if not a great critic at least a great thinker on the first principles of art and in those days when i used to listen to him while he talked to me of the basis of poetry and of metres and cadences and of poetical methods what meant more to me than anything he said though not a word was without its value was the profound religious gravity with which he treated the art of poetry the sense he conveyed to one of his own reasoned conception of its immense importance its divinity it was partly no doubt from this reverence for his art that patmore wrote so rarely and only under an impulse which could not be withstood even his prose was written with the same ardor and reluctance and a letter which he wrote to me from lymington dated august seventh eighteen ninety four in answer to a suggestion that he should join some other writers in a contemplated memorial to walter patter is literally exact in its statement of his own way of work not only during his later life i should have liked to make one of the honourable company of commentators upon patter were it not that the faculty of writing or what amounts to the same thing interest in writing has quite deserted me some accidental mode of wind comes over me once in a year or so and i find myself able to write half a dozen pages in an hour or two but all the rest of my time is hopelessly sterile to what was this curious difficulty or timidity in composition due in the case of the poetry mr goss attributes it largely to the fact of a poet of lyrical genius attempting to write only philosophical or narrative poetry and there is much truth in the suggestion nothing in patmore except his genius is so conspicuous as his limitations eric we may remember from his essay on mrs meynell seemed to him but a splendid insect keats we learn from mr champney's life seemed to him to be greatly deficient in first-rate imaginative power shelley is all unsubstantial splendor like the transformation scene of a pantomime or the silvered globes hung up in a gin palace blake is nearly all utter rubbish with here and there not so much a gleam as a trick of genius all this when he said it had a queer kind of delightfulness and to those able to understand him never seemed as it might have seemed in any one else mere arrogant bad taste but a necessary part of a very narrow and very intense nature although patmar was quite ready to give his opinion on any subject whether on wagner the musical impostor or on the grinning woman in every canvas of leonardo he was singularly lacking in the critical faculty even in regard to his own art and this was because in his own art he was a poet of one idea and of one metre he did marvellous things with that one idea and that one metre but he saw nothing beyond them all thought must be brought into relation with nuptial love or it was of no interest to him and the iambic metre must do everything that poetry need concern itself about doing in a memorandum for prayer made in eighteen sixty one we read this petition that i may be enabled to write my poetry from immediate perception of the truth and delight of love at once divine and human and that all events may so happen as shall best advance this my chief work and probable means of working out my own salvation in his earlier work it is with human love only that he deals in his later and inconceivably finer work it is not with human love only but with the relation of the soul to christ as his betrothed wife the burning heart of the universe as he realizes it this conception of love which we see developing from so tamely domestic a level to so incalculable a height of mystic rapture possessed the whole man throughout the whole of his life shutting him into a solitude for two which has never perhaps been apprehended with so complete a satisfaction he was a married monk 
whose monastery was the world he came and went in the world imagining he saw it more clearly than any one else and indeed he saw things about him clearly enough when they were remote enough from his household prejudices but all he really ever did was to cultivate a little corner of a garden where he brought to perfection a rare kind of flower which some thought too pretty to be fine and some too colorless to be beautiful but in which he saw the seven celestial colors faultlessly mingled and which he took to be the image of the flower most loved by the virgin in heaven patmore was a poet profoundly learned in the technique of his art and the prefatory study on english metrical law which fills the first eighty-five pages of the amelia volume of eighteen seventy eight is among the subtlest and most valuable of such studies which we have in english in this essay he praises the simplest metres for various just reasons but yet is careful to define the rhyme royal or stanza of seven ten-syllable lines as the most heroic of measures and to admit that blank verse which he never used is of all recognized english metres the most difficult to write well in but in his expressed aversion for trochaic and dactylic measures is he not merely recording his own inability to handle them and in setting more and more rigorous limits to himself in his own dealing with iambic measures is he not accepting and making the best of a lack of metrical flexibility it is nothing less than extraordinary to note that until the publication of the nine odes in 1868 not merely was he wholly tied to the iambic measure but even within those limits he was rarely quite so good in the four-line stanza of eights and sixes as in the four-line stanza of eights that he was usually less good in the six-line than in the four-line stanza of eights and sixes and that he was invariably least good in the stanza of three long lines which to most practical intents and purposes corresponds with this six-line stanza the extremely slight license which this rearrangement into longer lines affords was sufficient to disturb the balance of his cadences and nowhere else was he capable of writing quite such lines as one friend was left a falcon famed for beauty skill and size kept from his fortune's ruin for the sake of its great eyes all sense not merely of the delicacy but of the correctness of rhythm seems to have left him suddenly without warning and then the straightening and tightening of the bonds of metre having had its due effect an unprecedented thing occurred in the odes of 1868 absorbed finally into the unknown eros of 1877 the iambic metre is still used but with what a new freedom and at the summons of how liberating an inspiration at the same time patmore's substance is purged and his speech loosened and in throwing off that burden of prose stuff which had tied down the very wings of his imagination he finds himself rising on a different movement never was a development in metre so spiritually significant in spite of patmore's insistence to the contrary as in the letter which i have already quoted there is no doubt that the difference between the angel in the house and the unknown eros is the difference between what is sometimes poetry in spite of itself and what is poetry alike in accident and essence in all his work before the odes of 1868 patmore had been writing down to his conception of what poetry ought to be when through i know not what suffering or contemplation or actual inner illumination his whole soul had been possessed by this new conception of what poetry could be he began to write as finely and not only as neatly as he was able the poetry which came came fully clothed in a form of irregular but not lawless verse which mr goss states was introduced into english by the pindarique odes of cowley but which may be more justly derived as patmore himself in one of his prefaces intimates from an older and more genuine poet drummond of hawthornden mr goss is cruel enough to say that patmore had considerable affinities with cowley and that when patmore is languid and cowley is unusually felicitous it is difficult to see much difference in the form of their odes but patmore in his essay on metre has said 
if there is not sufficient motive power of passionate thought no typographical aids will make anything of this sort of verse but metrical nonsense which it nearly always is even in cowley whose brilliant wit and ingenuity are strangely out of harmony with most of his measures and it seems to me that he is wholly right in saying so the difference between the two is an essential one in patmore the cadence follows the contours of the thought or emotion like a transparent garment in cowley the form is a misshapen burden carried unsteadily it need not surprise us that to the ears of cowley it is he who tells us the verse of pindar should have sounded little better than prose the fault of his own pindar reek verse is that it is so much worse than prose the pauses in patmore left as they are to be a kind of breathing or pause for breath may not seem to be everywhere faultless to all ears but they are the pauses in breathing while in cowley the structure of his verse when it is irregular remains as external as mechanical as the couplets of the davides whether patmore ever acknowledged it or no or indeed whether says mr goss the fact has ever been observed i know not but the true analogy of the odes is with the italian lyric of the early renaissance it is in the writings of petrarch and dante and especially in the canzone of the former that we must look for examples of the source of patmore's later poetic form here again while there may be a closer analogy at least in spirit there is another an even clearer difference in form the canzone of petrarch are composed in stanzas of varying but in each case uniform length and every stanza corresponds precisely in metrical arrangement with every other stanza in the same canzone in english the epithalamion and the prothalamion of spencer except for their refrain do exactly what petrarch had done in italian and whatever further analogy there may be between the spirit of patmore's writing and that of spencer in these two poems the form is essentially different the resemblance with lycidas is closer and closer still with the poems of leopardi though patmore has not followed the italian habit of mingling rhymed and non-rhymed verse nor did he ever experiment like goethe hein matthew arnold and hinley in wholly unrhymed irregular lyrical verse patmore's endeavor in the unknown eros is certainly towards a form of vers libre but it is directed only towards the variation of the normal pause in the normal english metre the iambic common time and is therefore as strictly tied by law as a metre can possibly be when it ceases to be wholly regular verse literally free as it is being attempted in the present day in france every measure being mingled and the disentangling of them left wholly to the ear of the reader has indeed been attempted by great meterists in many ages but for the most part only very rarely and with extreme caution the warning so far of all these failures or momentary half successes is to be seen in the most monstrous and magnificent failure of the nineteenth century the leaves of grass of walt whitman patmore realized that without law there can be no order and thus no life for life is the result of a harmony between opposites for him cramped as he had been by a voluntary respect for far more than the letter of the law the discovery of a freer mode of speech was of incalculable advantage it removed from him all temptation to that cleverness which mr goss rightly finds in the handling of the accidents of civilized life the unfortunate part of his subject matter in the angel in the house it allowed him to abandon himself to the poetic ecstasy which in him was almost of the same nature as philosophy without translating it downward into the terms of popular apprehension it gave him a choice formal yet flexible means of expression for his uninterrupted contemplation of divine things nineteen o six end of coventry patmore part two section thirty three of figures of several centuries this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. 
Figures of Several Centuries by Arthur Simons Sarajini Naidu It was at my persuasion that The Golden Threshold was published. The earliest of the poems were read to me in London in 1896, when the writer was 17. The later ones were sent to me from India in 1904, when she was 25, and they belong, I think, almost wholly to those two periods. As they seemed to me to have an individual beauty of their own, I thought they ought to be published. The writer hesitated. Your letter made me very proud and very sad, she wrote. Is it possible that I have written verses that are filled with beauty, and is it possible that you really think them worthy of being given to the world? You know how high my ideal of art is, and to me, my poor casual little poems seem to be less than beautiful. I mean with that final enduring beauty that I desire. And in another letter, she writes, I am not a poet, really. I have the vision and the desire, but not the voice. If I could write just one poem full of beauty and the spirit of greatness, I should be exultantly silent forever. But I sing just as the birds do, and my songs are as ephemeral. It is for this bird-like quality of song, it seems to me, that they are to be valued. They hint in a sort of delicately evasive way at a rare temperament, the temperament of a woman of the East, finding expression through a Western language and under partly Western influences. They do not express the whole of that temperament, but they express, I think, its essence, and there is an Eastern magic in them. Sarojini Chattopadhyay was born at Hyderabad on February 13, 1879. Her father, Dr. Agoranath Chattopadhyay, is descended from the ancient family of Chattarajis of Brahman Gram, who were noted throughout eastern Bengal as patrons of Sanskrit learning and for their practice of yoga. He took his degree of Doctor of Science at the University of Edinburgh in 1877, and afterwards studied brilliantly at Bonn. On his return to India, he founded the Nizam College at Hyderabad, and has since laboured incessantly and at great personal sacrifice in the cause of education. Sarojini was the eldest of a large family, all of whom were taught English at an early age. I, she writes, was stubborn and refused to speak it. So one day, when I was nine years old, my father punished me, the only time I was ever punished, by shutting me in a room alone for a whole day. I came out of it a full-blown linguist. I have never spoken any other language to him or to my mother, who always speaks to me in Hindustani. I don't think I had any special hankering to write poetry as a little child, though I was of a very fanciful and dreamy nature. My training under my father's eye was of a sternly scientific character. He was determined that I should be a great mathematician or a scientist, but the poetic instinct, which I inherited from him and also from my mother, who wrote some lovely Bengali lyrics in her youth, proved stronger. One day, when I was eleven, I was sighing over a sum in algebra. It wouldn't come right but instead a whole poem came to me suddenly. I wrote it down. From that day, my poetic career began. At 13, I wrote a long poem a la Lady of the Lake, 1,300 lines in six days. At 13, I wrote a drama of 2,000 lines, a full-fledged passionate thing that I began on the spur of the moment, without forethought, just despite my doctor, who said I was very ill and must not touch a book. My health broke down permanently about this time, and my regular studies being stopped, I read voraciously. I suppose the greater part of my reading was done between 14 and 16. I wrote a novel, I wrote fat volumes of journals. I took myself very seriously in those days. Before she was 15, the great struggle of her life began. Dr. Govindurajulu Naidu, now her husband, is, though of an old and honourable family, not a Brahmin. The difference of caste roused an equal opposition, not only on the side of her family, but of his and in 1895 she was sent to England against her will with a special scholarship from the Nizam. She remained in England with an interval of travel in Italy till 1898, studying first at King's College, London, then, till her health again broke down, at Girton. She returned to Hyderabad in September 1898, and in the December of that year, to the scandal of all India, broke through the bonds of caste and married Dr. Naidu. Do you know I have some very beautiful poems floating in the air, she wrote to me in 1904, and if the gods are kind, I shall cast my soul like a net and capture them this year, if the gods are kind, and grant me a little measure of health. It is all I need to make my life perfect, for the very spirit of delight that Shelley wrote of dwells in my little home. It is full of the music of birds in the garden, and children in the long-arched veranda. There are songs about the children in this book, 
They are called the Lord of Battles, the Son of Victory, the Lotus Born, and the Jewel of Delight. My ancestors for thousands of years, I find written in one of her letters, have been lovers of the forest and mountain caves, great dreamers, great scholars, great ascetics. My father is a dreamer himself, a great dreamer, a great man whose life has been a magnificent failure. I suppose in the whole of India there are very few men whose learning is greater than his, and I don't think there are many more men beloved. He has a great white beard, and the profile of Homer, and a laugh that brings the roof down. He wasted all his money on two great objects, to help others, and on alchemy. He holds huge courts every day in his garden of all the learned men of all religions, rajas and beggars and saints, and downright villains, all delightfully mixed up and all treated as one. And then his alchemy, oh dear, night and day the experiments are going on, and every man who brings a new prescription is welcome as a brother. But this alchemy is, you know, only the material counterpart of a poet's craving for beauty, the eternal beauty. The makers of gold and the makers of verse, they are the twin creators that sway the world's secret desire for mystery. And what in my father is the genius of curiosity, the very essence of all scientific genius, in me is the desire for beauty. Do you remember Pater's phrase about Leonardo da Vinci, curiosity and the desire of beauty? It was the desire of beauty that made her a poet. Her nerves of delight were always quivering at the contact of beauty. To those who knew her in England, all the life of the tiny figure seemed to concentrate itself in the eyes. They turned towards beauty as the sunflower turns towards the sun, opening wider and wider until one saw nothing but the eyes. She was dressed always in clinging dresses of eastern silk, and as she was so small and her long black hair hung straight down her back, you might have taken her for a child. She spoke little and in a low voice like gentle music, and she seemed, wherever she was, to be alone. Through that soul I seemed to touch and take hold upon the East. At first there was the wisdom of the East. I have never known anyone who seemed to exist on such large drafts of intellectual day as this child of seventeen, to whom one could tell all one's personal troubles and agitations as to a wise old woman. In the East maturity comes early, and this child had already lived through all a woman's life. But there was something else, something hardly personal, something which belonged to a consciousness older than the Christian, which I realized, wondered at, and admired in her passionate tranquility of mind, before which everything mean and trivial and temporary caught fire and burnt away in smoke. Her body was never without suffering, or her heart without conflict. But neither the body's weakness nor the heart's violence could disturb that fixed contemplation as of Buddha on his lotus throne. And along with this wisdom, as of age, or of the age of a race, there was what I can hardly call less than an agony of sensation. Pain or pleasure transported her, and the whole of pain or pleasure might be held in a flower's cup, or the imagined frown of a friend. It was never found in those things to which others seemed things of importance. At the age of twelve she passed the matriculation of the Madras University, and awoke to find herself famous throughout India. Honestly, she said to me, I was not pleased. Such things did not appeal to me. But here, in a letter from Hyderabad, bidding one share a March morning with her, there is, at the mere contact of the sun, this outburst. Come and share my exquisite March morning with me, this sumptuous blaze of gold and sapphire sky, these scarlet lilies that adorn the sunshine, the voluptuous scents of neem and champak and serisha that beat upon the languid air with their implacable sweetness the thousand little gold and blue and silver-breasted birds bursting with the shrill ecstasy of life in nesting time. All is hot and fierce and passionate, ardent and unashamed in its exulting and importunate desire for life and love. And do you know that the scarlet lilies are woven petal by petal from my heart's blood? These little quivering birds are my soul made incarnate music, these heavy perfumes are my emotions dissolved into aerial essence. This flaming blue and gold sky is the very me, that part of me that incessantly and insolently, yes, and a little deliberately, triumphs over that other part, a thing of nerves and tissues that suffers and cries out, and that must die tomorrow, perhaps, or twenty years hence. Then there was her humour, which was part of her strange wisdom, and was always awake and on the watch. In all her letters, written in exquisite English prose, but with an ardent imagery and a vehement sincerity of emotion which make them, like the poems, indeed almost more directly un-English, oriental, 
there was always this intellectual, critical sense of humour, which could laugh at one's own enthusiasm as frankly as that enthusiasm had been set down. And partly the humour, like the delicate reserve of her manner, was a mask or a shelter. I have taught myself, she writes to me from India, to be commonplace and like everybody else superficially. Everyone thinks I am so nice and cheerful, so brave, all the banal things that are so comfortable to be. My mother knows me only as such a tranquil child, but so strong-willed. A tranquil child! And she writes again with deeper significance. I too have learnt the subtle philosophy of living from moment to moment. Yes, it is a subtle philosophy, though it appears merely an Epicurean doctrine. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. I have gone through so many yesterdays when I strove with death that I have realised to its full the wisdom of that sentence. And it is to me not merely a figure of speech, but a literal fact. Any tomorrow I might die. It is scarcely two months since I came back from the grave. Is it worthwhile to be anything but radiantly glad? Of all things that life or perhaps my temperament has given me, I prize the gift of laughter as beyond price. Her desire always was to be a wild free thing of the air like the birds with a song in my heart. A spirit of too much fire, in too frail a body, it was rarely that her desire was fully granted. But in Italy she found what she could not find in England, and from Italy her letters are radiant. This Italy is made of gold, she writes from Florence, the gold of dawn and daylight, the gold of the stars, and now dancing in weird enchanting rhythms through this magic month of May, the gold of fireflies in the perfumed darkness, aerial gold. I long to catch the subtle music of their fairy dances and write a poem with a rhythm like the quick, irregular, wild flash of their sudden movements. Would it not be wonderful? One black night I stood in a garden with fireflies in my hair like darting restless stars caught in a mesh of darkness. It gave me a strange sensation, as if I were not human at all, but an elfin spirit. I wonder why these little things move me so deeply. It is because I have a most unbalanced intellect, I suppose. Then, looking out on Florence, she cries, God, how beautiful it is, and how glad I am that I am alive today. And she tells me that she is drinking in the beauty like wine. Wine, golden and scented and shining, fit for the gods. And the gods have drunk it, the dead gods of Etruria, two thousand years ago. Did I say dead? No, for the gods are immortal, and one might still find them loitering in some solitary dell on the grey hillsides of Fiesol. Have I seen them? Yes, looking with dreaming eyes I have found them sitting under the olives in their grave, strong antique beauty, Etruscan gods. In Italy she watches the faces of the monks, and at one moment longs to attain to their peace by renunciation, longs for nirvana. Then, when one comes out again into the hot sunshine that warms one's blood, and sees the eager hurrying faces of men and women in the street, dramatic faces over which the disturbing experiences of life have passed and left their symbols, one's heart thrills up into one's throat. No, 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 a thousand times no. How can one deliberately renounce this coloured, unquiet, fiery human life of the earth? And all the time her subtle criticism is alert, and this woman of the East marvels at the women of the West, the beautiful worldly women of the West, whom she sees walking in the cascine, taking the air so consciously attractive in their brilliant toilettes, in the brilliant coquetry of their manner. She finds them a little incomprehensible, profound artists in all the subtle intricacies of fascination, and asks if these incalculable frivolities and vanities and coquetries and caprices are, to us, an essential part of their charm, and she watches them with amusement as they flutter about her, petting her as if she were a nice child, a child or a toy, not dreaming that she is saying to herself sorrowfully, how utterly empty their lives must be of all spiritual beauty if they are nothing more than they appear to be. She sat in our midst and judged us, and few knew what was passing behind that face like an awakening soul, to use one of her own epithets. Her eyes were like deep pools, and you seemed to fall through them into depths below depths. 1905 End of section 33Section 34 of Figures of Several Centuries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recorded by Charlotte Duckett. Figures of Several Centuries by Arthur Simmons. Section 34. Welsh Poetry. There is certainly a reason for at least suggesting to those who concern themselves, for good or evil, with Celtic literature. What Celtic literature really is when it is at its finest, what a reaction against the despotism of fact really means, what natural magic really means, and why the phrase Celtic glamour is perhaps one of the most unfortunate that could well have been chosen to express the character of a literature which is, above all things, precise, concrete, definite. Lamartine, in the preface to Meditations, describes the characteristics of Oshan very justly as la vague, la reverie, l'onéantisement dans les contemplations, le regard fixé sur des apparitions confusées dans le watin, and it is of those qualities, still looked upon by so many as typical, and it is of those qualities, still looked upon by so many as typical Celtic qualities, which proves the spuriousness of Oshan. That gaze fixed on formless and distant shadows, that losing oneself in contemplation, that vague dreaminess which Le Matin admired in Oshan will be found nowhere in the black co- will be found nowhere in the black book of Carmarthen, in the book of Taliesin, in the book of Taliesin, and in the red book of Hergest. However, much a doubtful text, uncertain readings, and confusing commentators may leave us in uncertainty as to the real meaning of many passages. Just as the true mystic just as the true mystic is the man who sees obscured things clearly, so the Welsh poets, whom I take this moment as representing the Celtic note, the quality which we find in the work of primitive races, saw everything in the universe, the wind itself, under the images of mortality, hands and feet, and the ways and motions of men. They filled human life with greatness of their imagination. They ennobled it with the pride of their expectancies of noble things. They were boundless in praising and in cursing, but poetical excitements in them only taught them by the aptitude and splendour of real things. A chief is an eagle, a serpent, a bull of battle, an oak. He is the strength of the ninth wave, an uplifted pillar of wrath impetuous as the fire through a chimney. The ruddy reapers of war are his desires. The heart of Kandishan was like the ice of winter, the fire of spring. The horses of Geraint are ruddy ones, with assaults of spotted eagles, of black eagles, of red eagles, of white eagles. The onset in battle is like the roaring of the wind against the ashen spears. These poets are the poets of tumults, shouting, swords, and men in battle array. The sound of battle is heard in them. They are where the ravens screamed over blood. They are amongst the crimsoned hair and clamorous sorrows. They praise war in they praise war in the shining wing. They know all the piteousness of the death of heroes the sense of the delicate white body, the lovely, slender, blood-stained body. <laughs> Shut up, dogs! Go away! The lovely, slender, blood-stained body that will be covered with earth and sand and stones and nettles and the roots of oaks. They know, too, the piteousness of the half left desolate, the half that will be covered with nettles and slender brambles and thorns and dock leaves, and scratched upon by fowls and turned up by swine. And they praise the gentleness of strength and courage. He was gentle, with a hand eager for battle. Women are known chiefly as widows, or the sleepless mothers of heroes, rarely so much esteemed to be in a snare, rarely a desire, rarely a reward, a soft herd. They praise drunkenness for its ecstasy, 
its uncalculating generosity, and the equal in the flowing of blood in battle and the flowing of mead in the hall, is the flowing of song. The haughtiness of those who, if they take their rewards, ale for the drinking, and a fair homestead and beautiful clothing, give rewards. I am Taliesin, who will repay thee thy banquet. And they have in their philosophy always a close, vehemently definite thing, crying out for precise images, which alone it can apprehend the unseen. Taliesin knows that man is oldest when he is born, and younger and younger continually. He wonders where man is when he is sleeping, and where the night waits until the passing of the day. He is astonished that books have not found out the soul, and where it resides, and the air it breathes, and its form and shape. He thinks, too, of the dregs of the soul, and debates what is the best intoxication for its petulance, and wonder, and mockery. And in a poem, certainly late, or interpolated with fragments of a Latin hymn, he uses the eternal numeration of the mystics, and speaks of the nine degrees of companies of heaven, and the tenth, saints, a preparation of sevens. Numbers that are clean and holy, and even in poems plainly Christian, there is a simplicity of imagination, as when, at the day of judgment, an arm reaches out and hides the sea and the stars, or when Christ, hanging on the cross, laments that the bones of his feet are stretched with extreme pain. It is this physical apprehension of things that really gives its notes to Welsh poetry, a sense of things felt and seen, so intense that the crutches on which an old man leans become the symbol of the bodily sorrows of the world. In a poem attributed to Llywar Hen, there is a fierce, loud complaint, in which mere physical sickness and intolerance of age translate themselves into a limitless hunger, and into a wisdom which the sorrowful desire of beauty. The cuckoos at the cuckoos at Ab the cuckoos at Abakuag, singing clamorously to the sick men. There is that hear them that will not hear them again. The sound of the large wave grating suddenly on the pebbles. The birds are clamorous, the strand is wet. Clear is the sky, large the wave, the heart is palsied with longing. All these bright, wild outcries, in which the wind and wave and leaves and the songs of the cuckoos speak the same word, as if they all came from the same heart of things, and through it all, the remembrance, God will not undo what he is doing, have indeed and supremely the Celtic note. I love the strand, but I hate the sea, says the Black Book of Carmarthen. And in all these poems, we will find more than medieval hatred of winter and cold, so pathetic, yet so temperate, in the Latin student's songs with a far more unbounded hatred of old age and sickness, and the disasters which are not bred of this world, but are in blind part of the universe itself. Older than the world, as old as chaos, out of which the world was made. Yet, wild and sorrowful as so much of this poetry is, with its praise of slaughter and its lament over death, there is so much of a gentle beauty, a childness saying over the wave and wind and brightness in the top of green things, as a child counts over its toys. In the song of pleasant things, there is no distinction between pleasantness and seagulls playing, of summer and slow days, of the heath when it is green, of a horse with a thick mane in a tangle, and of the word that utters the trinity. The beauty I sang of, I will sing, says Taliesin, says Taliesin. And with him the seven senses become a symbol, fire and earth, and water and air, and mist and flowers, and southerly wind. 
The touches of natural beauty come irreverently into the most tragical of places, like the sweet apple tree of delightful branches, in the song of battles, and the coming of madness, where Myrthen, where Myr, where Myrthen says, I have been wandering so long in the darkness and amongst spirits, that it is needless now for darkness and spirits to lead me astray. In the same sense of beauty of earth, and of the elements, comes into those mysterious riddle rhymes, not so far removed from riddle rhymes which children say to one another in Welsh cottages to this day. I have been a tear in, I have been a tear in the air, I have been the dullest of stars, I was made a flower of nettles, and of the water of the ninth wave, I played in the twilight, I slept in purple. My fingers are long and white. It is long since I was a herdsman. Now, after looking at these characteristics of Welsh poetry, look at Oshan, and that gaze fixed on formless and distant shadows, which seemed so impressive and so Celtic to Lamartine, that seemed so impressive and so Celtic to Lamartine. Shut up. In the morning of Saturday, or... On Sunday, at the time of dawn, there was a great battle, which is how the Welsh poets tell you what he had to sing about. And he tells you, in his definite way, more than that. He tells you, I have been where warriors were slain, from the east to the north, from the east to the south. I am alive, they are in their graves. It is human emotion reduced to its elements that instinct of life and death, of the mystery of all that is tangible in the world, of its personal meaning, to one man after another, age after age, which in every age becomes more difficult to feel simplicity, more difficult to say simply, I am alive, they are in their graves, and nothing remains in the face of that immense problem. Well, the Welsh poet leaves you with his thought, and that simple emphasis of him seems to us now so large and remote and impressive, just because it was once so passionately felt, and set down as it was felt. And so, with his sense for nature, with what seems like style to him, it is a wonderful way of trusting instinct, of trusting the approaches of natural things. He says, quite simply, I was told by a seagull that I had come a great way, as a child would tell you now. And when he tells you that, and when he tells you that, Sinon rushed forward with the green dawn, it is not what we call a figure of speech. It is his sensitive, literal way of seeing things, more definite, more concrete closer to the earth and to the instinct of emotion than most other poets. The Welsh poet might have said to himself, in another sense that it had been said, in another sense than which he had said it of Alexander, what he desired in his mind he had from the world. End of section 34 End of Figures of Several Centuries by Arthur Simmons